Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to, to another webinar, uh, part of the uh, Digital Lounge series for the uh, Let's Lab at the University of Greenwich. This is our first webinar for 2021, and I must say that things are already looking better. It is a Friday, and um, if you look outside of the window, you will see that it is sunny unless you're watching us from the other hemisphere. Uh, and we have a stellar panel for the day. So what more can you ask of life, really? Um, now, before I introduce you to um, today's speakers, uh, let me start with some housekeeping announcements. Um, and I will start with this. Uh, most Russian uh, cold era jokes, uh, they, they frequently start with a line, um, uh, means um, you will laugh about this, followed by something bitter or, or ironic. And I'll start by saying that you will laugh about this. But ironically enough, even though we'll be discussing about surveillance, uh, this event is being recorded <laughs> for archiving purposes, that is. Um, and uh, that said, we will not be recording uh, the Q&A at the end, uh, so as to enable uh, a free discussion. For the Q&A, please feel free to ask any questions at any moment um, using the uh, Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the, the Zoom page. And I will then be passing on your questions to the panel. Um, and, and yes, by questions, I, I do mean also observations or comments masked as questions. That's fine too. Um, and finally, the, uh, the nearest exit is the button at the bottom of the page that says leave meeting, but please don't, uh, because I'm pretty sure that this will not be necessary, um, as we are in for a treat today. We have three terrific guest speakers for the day um, joining us to discuss their latest book, MI5, The Cold War and the Rule of Law, are Professor Keith Ewing from King's College London, Dr. Joan Mahoney from the University of Southampton and Dr. Andrew Moretta from the University of Liverpool. Keith, Joan and Andrew, it is excellent to, to have you uh, with us and the floor is all yours. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting us uh, to, to be here today. Uh, thank you everyone else uh, for coming, uh, all of those of you that we can't see but uh, we we can feel your presence and uh, thank you very much for uh, for being here. Um, so I think what we're going to talk about today is uh, a book that we published uh, last year, uh, which has been based on many years of um, archival work at the National Archives, uh, looking at the role of MI5 uh, during the uh, Cold War. And uh, a lot of it, um, I think, just uh, consistent with the theme of this, uh, there's a group of seminars, I mean, some of it deals with uh, surveillance. Uh, but uh, I guess, um, I think one of the other themes of the seminars is uh, technology. Well, the technology in the surveillance methods that were used here, I guess, was fairly uh, rudimentary, but it was the beginning of uh, what we uh, see today and some of the stuff that uh, uh, Andrew will talk about um, will give us some kind of insight in the quickly developing technology that was used uh, even in the uh, early uh, Cold War uh, period. So what I want to do, I mean, just to get a sense of this, that um, in terms of a lot of this work involved uh, going through the uh, files of uh, individuals uh, who which are kept or which are now released to the national archives files kept by the state by mi5 um during the cold war period which presumably a practice which continues to this day but in a different form but in order to get a scale of it i mean of course they'll never tell you how many uh, people are under surveillance or how many files uh, there are or have been, but I mean, just I remember being struck uh, by one file that we took out, which was a file of the General Secretary of the Communist Party in the 1960s, a man called John Golan, 
And on the front of his file, there's a list of all the, the other people related to him, his members of his family, uh, about whom they also had files. Uh, and everyone who has a file has a personal file number, PF number. And in the case of uh, one of his nieces, uh, she was number PF 815,846. So even back in the 1960s, before Vietnam, uh, before Northern Ireland and before the uh, explosion, I think in the, activi the activities of the uh, surveillance activities of the security service and digging deep into uh, trade union activities, even then, um, we've, we're talking about uh, just under a million. And that is known in the sense that she, that 815,000, that's fairly random. I mean, it could be, you know, we could be looking at multiples of that. Uh, so it's simply, you don't know. Uh, and by the same uh, token, um, the uh, yeah, the files are, um, you know, not only do we uh, not know uh, the number of files, but of course they don't, unlike in some of the countries in Eastern Europe now, they don't release all of the files. So in a sense, what is released is a very selective uh, number, which I, th which I think, uh, in a fairly skeptical way, uh, is designed to allow the history of the Cold War to be written by the victors. So in a sense, the files that are released, I guess, the ones that will allow historians uh, to write the most favorable story uh, of the activities uh, which were conducted by the state and state institutions uh, during the Cold War period. So in a sense, even though, you know, whatever you can say, I mean, what we're telling you is, I think, probably a relatively benign story because it's based on data, which the state itself uh, has, has created uh, and, and provided. So there's no sense of any independent opportunity uh, to investigate uh, state files, even people who are long since dead. We get to see the files that the state itself uh, has uh, released. So the question then is what I just want to do is just go through some of the issues and I'll hand over to Andrew and then uh, Andrew will uh, hand over to John. So I'm just going to give some kind of general uh, introduction to some of the issues. Uh, and the first is to uh, uh, deal with, you know, the, the, the main focus of the study is uh, MI5. Uh, and in the course of this um, study, we look at the functions and powers of MI5 during the early Cold War periods uh, and how these functions and powers uh, uh, were used. And I think the starting point after the end of the Second World War uh, was that um, MI5 was taken under some kind of political uh, control uh, by the uh, then Prime Minister, uh, Clement Attlee, uh, who uh, Andrew found in his searches at the National Archives, uh, what we have referred to as the Attlee Directive, which was basically a directive issued to uh, the Director General of MI5, setting out the responsibilities of MI5, but also the responsibilities of the Director General to the Prime Minister, uh, so that the Prime Minister could keep some kind of tight rein uh, on the activities uh, of the service, to whom uh, the service had to uh, report on a fairly uh, regular basis. Now, under the directive, which in a sense was the, I think, probably the first formal charter of the organization, uh, the, uh, what the charter did uh, was to uh, say that, in a sense, your primary responsibility is the defense of the realm. Uh, and by defense of the realm, what we mean is that you're responsible for counter espionage and uh, counter uh, sub subversion and also uh, counter uh, sabotage. Now, that was the, in a sense, the, the purpose as expressed in this instruction from or this directive from the Prime Minister to the service. And that was the position until uh, 1952. And in 1952, uh, as a result of uh, pressure from uh, within uh, the cabinet office, nothing particularly the cabinet secretary, uh, the responsibility for uh, MI5 moved from the prime minister to the home secretary by what was known as the Maxwell Fife uh, Directive, which was then became, which replaced the Attlee Directive. Uh, and the Maxwell Fife Directive was also secret and uh, its cover was not blown until 1963, 
uh, until Lord Denning uh, produced the report on the Perfumo, Perfumo Affair, in which the, uh, the existence of the Maxwell Five Directive uh, was uh, acknowledged. But what happened in the meantime, I think, and this I think was important, was that with the transfer of responsibility to the Home Secretary, uh, there was also uh, not just a downgrading of scrutiny from Prime Minister to Home Secretary, but the Home Secretary himself basically showed no inclination uh, for uh, performing any effective scrutiny or control over the way in which MI5 operated. And basically, he cut them free uh, to do effectively whatever they liked. So that by 1961, the then Director General of MI5 could say to a judicial inquiry that they had, in his words, what he referred to as a glorious independence. And by glorious independence, it meant you have a security service operating within the state, which is subject to no effective uh, scrutiny uh, or accountability. Uh, and that lack of scrutiny and accountability actually had very, very adverse consequences uh, for the neglectful governments, because I think I mean, one of the view, one of the conclusions we reach uh, in the book is that it led directly to the uh, Perfumo affair in 1963, uh, and, and led, I think, to the collapse uh, of, of the then uh, Conservative government, or at least played a big part in the fall uh, of the government. So that was, in a sense, just in terms of the, the institutional framework within which uh, the service operated in the sense it was primarily with, under the uh, watchful eye of the Prime Minister and was then transferred to the neglectful and indifferent uh, eye of the uh, Home Secretary. And the other point I think that uh, comes out during this period is that although, the, although it was primarily a counter-espionage body, uh, MI5 actually found counter-espionage to be quite difficult. And it found uh, dealing with the, the Russians and the Russian embassy and um, the uh, Russian agents in this country, I actually found it quite a difficult uh, nut to crack. And as a result of that, uh, a lot of its energies uh, were displaced, I think, into what were quite safe uh, activities or quite easy uh, activities for the service to engage in. And that was counter uh, subversion and what we might refer to today effectively as uh, political policing. So what happened after during the Cold War that despite the problem of, of espionage in this and in other countries, uh, MI5's resources and activities, it seems, were devoted to a very large extent uh, to uh, counter subversion, even though MI5's own assessment of the Communist Party was that they were not a security risk in the sense they were not a risk, uh, or they, they did not present an espionage risk because the British Communist Party, underlying British, tried to maintain a real uh, independence, a real difference uh, from uh, the uh, Soviet Union and from the uh, CPSU. Uh, so the problem with that then for the, uh, so the, problem, the issue then is that security service had these two principal functions, counter espionage and counter subversion. It found counter uh, espionage very difficult. It was not very good at it. And its resources then went into something which it was very comfortable with and which it appeared to quite like to do, uh, which was counter subversion in inverted commas, which involved basically monitoring you know, the work of the communist party uh, and other organizations operating on the left, uh, principally which the uh, security service uh, believed to be or thought to be in some way uh, uh, penetrated uh, by the uh, Communist Party or acting under the influence uh, of the Communist Party. And the effect of that, of course, is that by devoting so much resource and attention uh, to this uh, uh, fake enemy, if you like, uh, is that the, the real job uh, uh, went undone. And so during the 50s and 60s, we did have a, a number of major uh, spy uh, scandals, which you know, by any reckoning, I think, were due in large part to the failure of MI5 uh, properly to discharge uh, the obligations uh, which it had been uh, set up to, uh, uh, to do. In a sense, it simply failed on the job as a result of which and we had many uh, scandals, which we describe in the book, uh, of failure to deal with the 
the threat of espionage because all the resources, it seems, and all the activity had been displaced into uh, counter uh, espionage. So the question then is, well, how, how did they do it? What did they do? How did they go about uh, uh, seeking to uh, uh, basically uh, uh, keep the Communist Party and uh, other groups on the left, um, in a sense, uh, under some kind of uh, uh, control or uh, under some kind of surveillance? And what we discovered, I think there's nothing new in this, I don't suppose, but I mean, what we discovered from the files, the files are interesting because you get all these uh, surveillance reports or different types of uh, surveillance uh, activities and methods which are being used. But basically what you see, I think probably about uh, five different techniques of surveillance that were, were used. And uh, the first, the most basic was basically, it was incredible that people would go to, you know, first would be the kind of volunteer, the people who would go to the police, would simply turn up at a police station and report on their fellow citizens or in one case to report on a university teacher. So if the father of a, of a student who went to the police to report uh, the, the son's teacher because the, 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 father, the, the teacher was actually a very famous uh, musician, uh, and but also a Communist Party member, and the father was very upset about the, um, what it may be that this uh, music teacher was teaching uh, his son. And then, so you see in the file of the individual in question, uh, all this, uh, all this, all written up by you know, the, the desk sergeant. At some point, his report gets passed on to special branch, uh, and the special branch report appears in the file uh, of the uh, musician. And then the other, secondly, we're looking at uh, infiltration you, uh, of uh, stuff that you read about today in the spy cop scandal, the infiltration of organisations, and the use of uh, informers in uh, organizations and the you know, Communist Party was deeply infiltrated, uh, a lot of peace groups deeply infiltrated, uh, lawyers groups, the holding society of uh, socialist lawyers deeply, deeply uh, penetrated, uh, as were a number of trade unions. So you're reading back all the reports from these sources, either reporting directly to MI5 or reporting to MI5 through MI5 uh, intermediaries. So all this stuff uh, appears uh, in the file. And then thirdly, you get uh, mail interception, of course, and you've got to bear in mind that the equivalent to email in the 1940s, 1950s was uh, the, the regular post. And some people would be receiving postal deliveries maybe up to four or five times a day. So it's not like, I mean, today, when you're lucky if you get one postal delivery. In those days, I mean, if you lived in London in particular, you could have several deliveries in the course of the day. Well, so there'd be a huge volume of, of, of correspondence, huge volume of traffic. We even had a government minister responsible for the post office. I mean, it was a very, we underestimate now how an important a service uh, this was, a cabinet minister, government department cabinet minister responsible for the... A postal service was a hugely, hugely important uh, uh, service. But all this, of course, stuff gets uh, intercepted and what would happen, either the content of the letter would be photographed in a very, very um, uh, odd way because the technology was, wasn't great in those days, or it would be typed out. I mean, extraordinarily. So in the sense, you see, you have all these typers running for MI5 who would be typing out the content of uh, intercepted uh, uh, correspondence. And this would be done, I mean, the interesting thing about this is the ways by which stuff was intercepted. So they developed not just interception at the point of receipt, but also they could intercept mail at the point of, uh, the point it was posted uh, by a process that was called rat catcher. So they had all these fancy nicknames for the different techniques that they used. So now that was quite a sophisticated um, uh, uh, way of getting stuff. And even organizations like the National Council for Civil Liberties was subject to this kind of rat catcher interception of its mail. Once they found out where you posted your letters, they could intercept the post box or intercept at the uh, post office, uh, the, the whole bundle, the whole package of mail that you were uh, sending out. And then the other, uh, the third, so the fourth example. So what we've got, uh, the volunteer, the info and informers, uh, mail tapping. Fourth, of course, was uh, phone tapping, uh, which uh, you know, was was done, well, not everybody had phones in those days. It was quite unusual, I guess, 
in those days for people to have a telephone and you know, it's quite hard to explain to younger um uh to, you know, younger generations just what the telephone technology was like uh in the uh old days uh, but um but for those who did have phones and certainly leading leading figures in these organizations uh, would uh, have uh, telephones their phones would be uh, intercepted uh, and uh, Andrew will tell us there were it's not just intercepting phone calls that was the 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 issue uh, but also it was the way in which they could use the telephone as a listening device as a form of uh, uh, microphone in the house so you're not just picking up uh, telephone calls or telephone messages you're picking up all the conversations that are taking place and this of course very controversial uh, because this is precisely the type of uh, technology that Orwell was writing about and creating fear about when he wrote uh, uh, 1984 in 1949. Well, people were to know that this was not just a futuristic account by Orwell, but actually something was actually happening, then there would have been, I think, a, a lot of concern about the use of this uh, technology. And then I think beyond that, of course, fifthly or fourthly, fifthly, we've got the use of bugging devices, which again, Andrew will talk about, uh, and what were referred to as uh, uh, special uh, facilities, which is a term of art, which was used by government uh, and uh, MI5. I'll leave Andrew to speak more about that. And use special facilities, facilities involves, again, using the phone and using uh, microphone technology. Uh, which again was in its infancy uh, at this time and then finally i think just uh, just to be used mainly in the context of its limited counter espionage uh, work there was some interrogation and questioning of individuals that took place by mi5 even though the myth perpetuated that mi5 were not the police they had no executive power uh, and that uh, any conduct which requires questioning and interrogating people uh, was the responsibility of the um, uh, of the police. Well, that's in fact not the case. I mean, it's quite clear that MI5 officers did interrogate uh, and question uh, people they thought to be suspected of uh, espionage. And some of the people, one person in particular, who was one agent identified, uh, later became a high court judge. And I think it says a lot about this country, the promiscuity of our constitutional system. There's somebody who can be who can be an MI5 agent actually working in the field can become at some point a high court judge. And of course, when he was a high court judge operating in the 1970s, his previous history would have been unknown uh, to those who appeared uh, before him. So let me finally just say something then about so since these were, I mean, and by these different methods, they they they, they um, accumulated a vast amount uh, of material uh, which appears uh, in these files, and you know, anybody can go to Q or you know, when the pandemic is over, when Q reopens, you go down, you pull these files out, and you can see what's in them. I mean, it's just it's just extraordinary uh, to, to 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 see, uh, and you know, the question. You pick up some of these files. I mean, it's just it's just it's just information uh, kept for the sake of it or collected for the sake of it. You wonder why do we need to know uh, all these things about personal, private conversations between a husband and wife about what time so and so will be home for his evening meal. Well, why do we need to keep all this information or well, the arrangements that we made with the garage uh, to fit his new Motorola car radio? Well, and who? Why? I mean, why do we need to know that? And why do we need to retain all this uh, information? But it does raise questions about how this, uh, how this information, uh, how it was used. I mean, in a sense, why was it collected uh, and uh, how was it used? And I'm still scratching my head. Uh, I, I'm reminded, actually, scratching my head wondering, I'm reminded of a, a visit I paid to the, um, the barracks at, uh, in New South Wales, which was the oldest building uh, in, um, in uh sydney new south wales and you go in there you'll see in the corner is a, a little cage a lot of rats in the cage and what they discovered when they uh, refurbished this building was that uh, over 200 years or so all the rats in the building had basically collected all this material all this ephemera you know nails and combs and buttons and cloth and basically had stored it so between the ceiling and the floor 
at the different levels so that the, the, the space between the, the, the floor and the ceiling had become impacted with detritus and debris. And basically just for the sake of it, there was no rational reason for the rats to do this. They just collected information, which for historians proved to be fascinating. It was fantastic such, because it gave such a, a vivid a social history uh, of Sydney over a period of 200 years. But when I go into these files, I feel exactly the same. All you, what you see here is a lot of people, a lot of people collecting all this information just for the sake of it. We're having absolutely no purpose whatsoever beyond the collection of information. It was a bit like the stamp collector or the coin collector or the theatre program collector, collecting information just for the sake of having it. And it seemed to me to serve absolutely no rational purpose for the most part. Now, in a sense, certainly not, you know, there was some information that, that they, they, they felt they needed to know and which they were able to use. But the amount of material that was collected was completely out of all proportion uh, to what was needed for the purpose for which uh, they claim uh, uh, to, 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 to have used it. And a lot of cross-referencing and uh, all the rest of it. I mean, in a sense, it was an extraordinary operation uh, in the sense of filing itself uh, but for what purpose, you've got to, to ask. So the question is, well, what, what were they doing? Well, basically, they were monitoring individuals uh, and organizations uh, that were trying to get uh, information about, in the case of a lawyer, about his uh, bargain, his, his position he was taking in uh, his advice uh, to uh, his clients, in the case of trade unions, uh, trying to find out what was going on in the context of uh, strike action, presumably to enable them to prepare for and anticipate uh, what the, um, the strike demands would be and how perhaps how employers could best deal with these. But principally, I think uh, the main purpose of this information was to be able to find out uh, who was a member of the Communist Party, uh, who had some kind of association with the Communist Party in order to exclude them from certain forms of employment. And that seems to me to be the main reason, the main use of which this, this information or the data collected that was used. So, so in a sense, I mean, the MI5 got a real break from Attlee in 1948, uh, when the government uh, decided uh, that anyone who was a Communist Party member would not be eligible for employment in certain senior civil service positions. Well, in order to operate that rule, you've got to know who Communist Party members are. Uh, so that was a fantastic liberation of MI5. It justified and vindicated their counter-subversion activity, finding out who our Communist Party members. We need to know that. Now, the government requires us to have this information in order to operate this policy of exclusion of people from the civil service. Even though we're only looking at a small number of positions, we've got to have this database of million, millions of people in order to know which of them were Communist Party members, sympathizers, or uh, fellow uh, travelers. Uh, and the other use to which it was it was put was to find out um, you know, who were Communist Party members in order to exclude them from certain forms of private sector employment, because there was a rule operating at the time, and whereby anybody who was employed by uh, uh, you know, any, any employer uh, who had a government contract, public service contract, could not employ uh, a communist on, on certain secret uh, activities. So we've got this huge private sector operation that's a massive vetting program going on by MI5 in both the public and the private sectors. And then it, it was extended to trade unions. So the government refused to deal with trade unions uh, whose uh, senior figures, senior officers included uh, Communist Party members. So we've got to purge the trade unions just as we purged uh, private sector employers and just as we purged uh, uh, the civil service and other public sector employers. So that, in a sense, I think was, it seems to me to be principally the, um, the uh, purpose, well, no, no, perhaps not the purpose. I think the purpose of collecting the information was just simply to collect the information. But in terms of the use of the information, that seems to be the main way in which the information was, was used, which was basically to facilitate the discrimination against people on uh, political grounds simply because they were a membership of or had an association with a political party, which MI5 itself said in its own security briefing for a government inquiry, itself said explicitly that in its view, the Communist Party was not a threat to national security or to the defense of the realm.
for reasons I've given already. So that's in a sense, is a bit of an overview. I'm going to pass on to Andrew. I was supposed to speak for 15 minutes. I've only gone for 30. I apologize. So, um, okay, over to you, Andrew. Sorry. Um, can you hear me okay? You need to speak up a bit. So. Right, okay. Well, okay, I'll proceed. But if, if, if I'm inaudible, don't hesitate just to tell me to shut up because it won't be worth just watching me move my lips. Okay. So I'll, I'll crack on. Okay. I'll say a few things about electronic eavesdropping, most of which is to be found in chapter eight of the book, which contains much more than I'll tell you here. I've been aware that the British Communist Party's headquarters has been found since reading Kim Philby's book, My Secret War. And I remember Keith and I looking through some files down at the National Archives at Kew back in 2012 and seeing a transcript of a conversation attributed to KS and to Source Table. And we rapidly realised that this was something that had been picked up by one of their hidden microphones installed at King Street. King Street was the Covent Garden Street where the CPGB was based. Um, we subsequently found out that the MI files, MI5 files at Kew are stuffed with transcripts obtained by the installation and listening devices at King Street. Transcripts of conversations picked up by microphones planted elsewhere, usually in domestic premises, are less common, but there are plenty of them in the files if you look hard enough. Coyly referred to by MI5 as Special Facilities, or SF, Initially, most SF arrangements made use of the microphone in the handset and the telephone. Telephones were adjusted so that the mic would continue to work when the handset was in the cradle and the phone was not being used. The phone would continue to function normally then. MI5 had to be sure that the phones were in place in a place suitable for eavesdropping. MI5 records inadvertently revealed to us that Donald McLean had an SF activated phone in his bedroom, and ex MI5 officer Peter Wright revealed in his book Spy Catcher that Anthony Blunt took the precaution of having his home telephone installed at the end of a long corridor. In the early Cold War, listeners employed by the post office but based at MI5 would listen to the conversations live, recording the more obviously interesting conversations on acetate discs and providing MI5 officers with written transcripts. Freestanding microphones were infiltrated into King Street as the Cold War progressed. Uh, one was discovered in 1977 by builders making renovations to the building. His microphones, which might transmit a radio signal, will be linked to the MI5 listeners by a cable, which may or may not have been part of this telephone network, were also referred to as SF, although strictly speaking, SF related to adaptive telephones. So guarded were MF, uh, MI5 about SF that in its records it referred to its electronic eavesdropping transcript as if they had been obtained from human sources, table, source table, source north, and source, source Lascar were early Cold War, uh, Cold War code names. Where possible, MI5 avoided even referring to SF at all and it is apparent that there was a policy of removing documents referring to the installation and use of SF from personal files and placing them in, in files which are unlikely ever to be released, although some of the transcripts obtained often remained in the original files. All this was done long before it even been thought that MI5 personal files would be released to the National Archives. Some SF-related documents, which are not transcripts of conversations, remain in the personal files. However, in almost all such instances, MI5 readers have attempted to remove the words special facilities and SF. In one document, it is apparent that someone has cut out the offending words with a razor blade. Such is MI5's long-standing and continuing sensitivity about electronic eavesdropping. But the MI5 readers sometimes make mistakes, and even when they have redacted a mention of SF, the context and the size of the gap in text usually make it abundantly obvious that SF or the word special facilities have been removed. So, while we were able to read the fruits of SF in the MI5 files, and occasionally we were able to catch a glimpse of the practice of electronic eavesdropping in the files, 
we largely learned about SEC in practice from Duncan Campbell's 1981 book, Phone Tappers in the Security State, which is a collection of new statesman articles relating to tapping and bugging in the late 1970s, and principally from Peter Wright's 1987 memoir, Spy Catcher. Campbell got much of his information from post office staff. Um, the post office ran the UK phone network in the UK prior to the mid 1980s. And his book makes fascinating reading. But Wright's first hand account of developing and using SF are brilliant. Wright recalls breaking into premises to install SF, guided by the well known principle don't get caught. He also recounted entering premises posing as a telephone engineer alongside members of the post office special investigation section. As for the legal mandate, the use of SF and for installing it, we relied on Christopher Andrews' official history of MI5. That told us that the Home Office warrant system did not cover the use and installation of SF and that MI5 had believed that these criminal acts and trespasses were permitted by the Royal Prerogative. However, one of the turning points in our research was the discovery of the Atley Directive issued to the head of MI5 in 1946. That directive, which was MI5's charter, and it was its first charter, had been written by Attlee and the then Cabinet Secretary, um, and it subsequently became known as the Maxwell Fife Directive when it was reissued in 1952 after being amended by the senior men at MI5. The Attlee Directive stated that the use of SF must be supervised by the Home Secretary, indicating that the Home Secretary was indeed required to warrant the use of special facilities. The 1945 Findlay to Stewart report, which informed the directive, had recommended that, I quote, specific authority be obtained from the Home Secretary whenever it is proposed to install a microphone. Other evidence indicated the same. The KGB archives, which were briefly opened after the fall of the Soviet Union, had shown that Anthony Blunt had revealed to the Soviets that bugging was sanctioned by a Home Office warrant. We also found an MI5 administrative memo referring to a central index of Home Office warrants covering, and I quote, letter checks, telephone checks, and SFs, suggesting that warrants were issued. Indeed, in 1984, The Guardian had incidentally revealed in a very muddled report, obviously based on genuine information provided by a Home Office source, um, and the Home Office source had been emphatic that telephonic SF required a Home Office warrant. The source was also apparently equally insistent that the warrants did not san sanction any associated burglary and that freestanding microphones did not re require a warrant. MI5 and Home Office sen sensitivity is largely due to the fact that MI5 acted illegally for many years before covert entries were embraced by the Home Office warrant system following the Security Service Act 1989 and that the Home Office was complicit in these illegal acts, either issuing warrants with no basis in law or just giving MI5 a nod or turning a blind eye. As Peter White famously said, and I quote, we burgled and bugged our way across London while bowler-hatted civil servants in Whitehall looked the other way. MI5's official history did state that ASF installations were sanctioned by the permanent undersecretary at the Home Office rather than the Home Secretary. However, while the heavily redacted wartime and post-war diary of the Deputy General of MI5 shows that the PUS did indeed heavily influence what received Home Office sanction and what didn't, it also shows that the PUS himself considered that the, and I quote, grave responsibility with regard to SF lay with the Home Secretary himself. So grave was that responsibility that in the book, we show that it was one of the key factors in motivating the cabinet secretary and the head of the then civil service to seek to persuade Atley to relinquish his role as the minister responsible for MI5 and transfer that responsibility to the Home Secretary. The cabinet office records we found show that they were aware of MI5's capacity for making mistakes and that they were aware of the potential and the use of SF and the, 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 the potential that had for severely damaging the Atlee government had been particularly sensitive to the accusation that it was running its own political police and it had, and had it become known that it was sanctioning the use of telephones to monitor domestic conversations while the phone remained on the hook, 
And don't forget that this was a time when even having a telephone in the house was considered by some to be a breach of privacy. And if the story caught the imagination of Fleet Street, then the consequences could have been politically disastrous. In fact, the story nearly broke in 1952, the year that responsibility for MI5 was passed to the Home Office, and the year that the Atlee Directive became the Maxwell 5 Directive in the process dropping requirements relating to SF on the questionable grounds that SF had always required Home Office sanction, even before the Atlee Directive was issued. Tony Bunyan, in his great 1977 book, The History and Practice of the Political Police in Britain, recorded that a local, a local paper in Slough reported the tour of the telephone exchange and the visitors were told not only of the phone tapping arrangements at the Slough telephone exchange, but of the use of special facilities. I looked for that article in the British Library, but I couldn't find it. I did, however, find a subsequent Sunday pictorial article from 1952, which had picked up on the original article and used the information. However, the enormity of the story appeared to have been lost on the pictorial and also on the rest of Fleet Street. Like many who visit the National Archives and read SF transcripts and assume that they are fruits of a telephone tap, the papers appeared to have seen in 1952 as concerned solely with the interception of messages rather than with electronic eavesdropping, a subtle distinction which appears to have been relied upon to allow eavesdropping to be sidelined later on in the 1950s as the public became more aware that the state permitted itself to read people's letters and to listen to their telephone conversations. And that is the end of my brief of the speech. Um, take it away. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. I'll just hand over to, to Joanne. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm just sort of connecting the dots here. Uh, a little bit and talking about the sort of theory behind what we've done as opposed to the specifics. Um, because after all, the title of the book is MI5, the Cold War and the Rule of Law. Uh, and, you know, as we know, the concept, the principle of the rule of law goes back very far in British constitutional history. Some of us like to date it to the Magna Carta. Um, became really a subject of theoretical scholarly discussion, probably starting with Dicey. Uh, Dicey set out three rules uh, for uh, the rule of law, uh, the predominance of regular law as opposed to arbitrary power, equality before the law, and he saw the common law as the protection of fundamental freedoms. Now, that view is, um, controversial, uh, has been attacked, um, uh, particularly Ivor Jennings in his youth um, critiqued the dicey view as providing insufficient protection for civil liberties, which is, it makes sense because if dicey says the common law is going to protect civil liberties, and dicey also says in his other works that parliament is supreme and parliament can pass any law they want, that means that we are relying on the absence of parliamentary action and the action of common law courts to protect our civil liberties, which is, you know, a two-way, maybe multi-edged sword. Um, my favorite line of Dicey's, I think, is when he's asked, you know, about the British Constitution, he says, the Constitution permits everything that is not forbidden, <laughs> which is... Yeah. Uh, so uh, so the, the argument was that doesn't provide sufficient protection. And, and that that argument has been taken up in recent years by people like Ronald Dworkin, who have said the rule of law must contain uh, substantive protections for civil liberties, as well as procedural protections for fair trial and no charge without, you know, statute, et cetera. Um, for our purposes, I'm not sure it matters which view you adopt, uh, because even the, as it's called, thin version, uh, procedural version of the rule of law, um, <laughs> provides more protection than 
uh, was applied essentially to the acts of MI5. And um, I, I, I like the, the argument of ECS Wade that the way we know that Britain is better than all those other countries is because we have the rule of law and that's better than the totalitarian, totalitarian states with their secret police. But of course, did he know we also had a secret police? Uh, I'm gonna, uh, one little aside here because I can't resist. Um, uh, I grew up in the United States a long time ago uh, when the left was under extraordinary attack um, by statutes such as the Smith Act and the Espionage Act, which led to, you know, to executions, um, and also by extra legal and non-governmental actions. Uh, Keith talked earlier about people being fired from private employment if there was a government contract. Uh, that wasn't necessary in the US. My uncle was fired from his job as a newspaper reporter um, because he refused to name names when he was called up in front of a congressional um, congressional investigating committee. Uh, he is cited in David Coates' book, uh, The Great Fear. I call it in there. Um, and my mother had friends who were either deported to Britain um, or came here seeking refuge. Um, and she told me when I was young that Britain was so much better in the US because her friends there told her that you did not get file, followed by the FBI. Uh, they didn't come to your door. Uh, people I grew up with would have, the FBI would turn up at your door and knock and say, hi, do you have anything to tell us? My friends would say, no, nope, not today. Okay, and they go away. Um, and she said, that doesn't happen in Britain. Nobody follows you. Well, he was wrong <laughs> as we have discovered. Uh, I believed it. That's one of the reasons why I started this project many, many years ago, because uh, I was quite convinced that there was nothing here equivalent to the FBI in the United States. Uh, she was wrong. I was wrong. Uh, I suspect that our imported friend was um, uh, kept under surveillance here just as much as she was in the US. Um, so we have judges who were during those years appointed to review security breaches, um, but they were more concerned with the failures of security than they were with violations of civil liberties. Uh, and we can see from what Keith and Andrew have set out for us uh, that uh, we did have a secret police, that Wade was wrong, uh, that did not distinguish us from totalitarian countries. Uh, we had um, MI5 operating in secret without a statutory mandate, violating individual rights. Um, arguably, before the Malone case, could they say, oh, we didn't know that wiretapping was wrong? Maybe, but you know, after Entick and Carrington, we knew that breaking into somebody's house to plant uh, a microphone in their phone, we knew that was wrong. <laughs> I mean, the rest of us knew that was wrong. Um, so it doesn't matter whether you take a Dyson view uh, or a more expansive view of the rule of law. Um, at the very least, it ought to prevent a secret organization uh, sponsored by the government from wiretapping, planting listening devices, and opening the mail of many individuals who were not, and I'm going to repeat this even though Keith said it because it's so important to say again, were not suspected of committing a crime, were not suspected of espionage, but merely were members of a party that the government had chosen to view as subversive. Uh, at a time, by the way, um, at least, well, immediately after 1945, that there were in fact two communists elected to parliament. And yet members of the party were treated as uh, suspect um, and huge files were, were created. Um, and I just want to um, close by reading, what is I think the last line of the book. Uh, Although these are not the standards of a constitutional democracy founded on the rule of law, and this is the important bit, they are the standards of the past that continue to haunt the practices of today. And with that, I will close. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Joe. And that was 
Um, that was a lot <laughs> to, di to digest. It was certainly mind-blowing. Um, I will be asking the questions that I see in the Q&A, so please type in any questions you might have. And um, uh, Joanne, um, the, uh, the, the last part uh, of your talk actually uh, prompts my, my first question. And it's not an easy one. <laughs> this goes to all of you. So what are the lessons learned here? Have we, have we learned anything? And most importantly, if, if someone was to write a similar book in 20 years from today, what do you think that they would uh, include in this book? How, how would they rewrite history or um, report back? You mean if they were reporting on the present? Yes, and, and the lessons learned really. Uh, so your, your book is, uh, is a good, um, well, let's say a testament of the things that have happened in the past, but it's also great, or it should be providing great guidance as to what to avoid in the future. So have we learned anything? <laughs> no. Keith, that's, isn't that really your... Yeah, uh, the point I would make is, um, you know, periodically we have all these uh, scandals about the security service or special branch or the police. And, you know, there's always an element of skepticism. People don't believe it. But... My, my uh, sense is why, why the history is important because, is because the history creates a culture about a culture of, behave, of behavior and a culture of impunity within organ behavior by impunity within organizations from which it is very, very difficult to break without some kind of uh, dislocation of a kind that we've never had in this country. So what you have is a sense of historical continuity and that's why the last sentence of the book, which John read, is important. Because when we see things like spy cops, which are going on at the moment, well, spy cops is very believable when you set it in the context of what went before. I mean, it's you know, what we, we, we do a lot of stuff in the book about the surveillance of trade unionists and the use of information against trade unionists, um, you know, not, not because of their politics, well, because they are trade unionists engaged in legitimate trade union activity. So in a sense, it, it helps to, 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 to dispel doubts and to uh, reinforce the claims of those who are making these claims today, the, the contemporary claims. So there is a continuity from the past to the present. And there's no reason to disbelieve uh, those who make these claims today. And there's no reason to believe that, that, that MI5 and Special Branch and whoever are not, uh, are not engaged in activities that many people would be, frankly, appalled by. And I think the other point, the other lesson from the past is that, uh, which comes across, you know, very carefully, it just shouts at you, actually, from, 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 from the past, is that, uh, the second, is that the technology is, is always in advance of the law. And so whatever legal framework is there, the law is always running to catch up. And you know, sometimes the law can be laps and laps behind uh, because the technology moves so quickly. So the stuff that Andrew was talking about, special facilities and microphones, you know, maybe Orwell had advertised this, but nobody could possibly have believed that this was going on. But there was a clear need for some kind of, um, of, uh, of legal uh, response. Uh, to this activity, but I mean, nobody knew about it, so why would there be a response? And I would say the third point, actually, which comes out of it, is I think, I mean, there was, um, and it comes back to the stuff about the rule of law, I mean, there's clear evidence of unlawful conduct in the past. And again, so it comes back to this point about impunity, that in the sense that organizations which operate in the shadows and which have in the past been accustomed to uh, operating unlawfully and their unlawful conduct being covered up and then, then getting away with it. Uh, there is no reason to believe that that will not continue into the future. That is their modus operandi, when they are focused on targets, not on methods. And so if it means in order to, to, to meet the target, they've got to break the law, then they will break the law. And they'll ask the questions afterwards. And I think that's, that was another lesson that I've learned uh, from this. So in a sense, if you didn't start off uh, neurotic and skeptical, uh, from a project like this, you certainly end up not neurotic, but certainly very, very skeptical about what's going on today. And I would believe nothing 
that anybody tells me about the conduct of the police or the security services. Nothing. Because I'm not sure there is a truth now. Since there, there is our truth and there is, you know, there's an institutional truth, which may be different from, uh, you know, from what other people would regard to be as true. So, so I think, yeah, it's, it's, but I imagine the story would be much the same, although there might, there might be a veneer of legality now. Oh, thank you for that. Um, so, of course, Andrew, I'm, I'm handing over to you. Yes, please. All right, good. Um, yeah, I would say that the, the, the big lesson is keep the security service on a tight leash because they will inevitably drift back into political policing because that's what they do. And that's what we've seen lately with the spy cops. Then. The, the, the cops were, 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 were just left to themselves and they drifted back into political policing. They drifted back into acting against the unions. That's what happened. That, and we saw that's what happened in the book. Initially, after the after the end of the Second World War, the Attlee government had <laughs> one of very idealistic ideas about civil liberty. They sought to rein in the activities of the security service. The security service kicked against that because they didn't really want to. They weren't set up to catch spies. They were set up to, to deal with political policing. And that's what they drifted back into. So you had the Atley Directive revised specifically by MI5 in 1952 to permit that. And that's what they did. They got their own way in the end and they drifted back. So that's one thing that we can, that's possibly the very big thing that we can, the lesson that we can draw from the book. I mean, you know, as Keith said earlier, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a big book, but one of the gifts that was presented to MI5 was the um, uh, ban on uh, communists in the civil service. And so that really helped them on their way to start off as a, as a, as a properly and a legitimate political peace group, so that they were helped along their way by events. But really the overarching thing is that you have to keep the security services in the type of... Um, and one of the, one of the contrasts <coughs> with the book is that you have paragraph seven of the Atlas Directive saying um, that uh, special facilities must be supervised by the Home Office. Fast forward to 2016, you've got the Investigative Powers Act, which um, essentially gives carte blanche to MI5 and the police to just do whatever they want in, in cyberspace. And there are just, there's just tons of, 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 of information on how they get warrants to spy on us and we've come to accept that they will spy on us just as i said earlier in the late 50s we're just starting to come down to the idea that they looked at your post and they listened to your telephone call now we've accepted just as they did in 1984 that we're being watched all the time and that we, we, we really have precious little protection against being watched in the manner that we are watched. It's it's quite extraordinary. In fact it's it's such a it's such a massive change that it's almost become like invisible to us. We can't really see the way that our privacy is being invaded and it's being invaded massively. We just take it for granted that they know what we're doing, whatever we're doing. It's extraordinary. No, thank you very much for that, Andrew. And thank you for also mentioning the Investigatory Powers Act. It, it actually came to mind when I was listening to Keith saying at the point, why would they need all this information? And why were they keeping all these records and for so long and data retention? And this, this really came, came to mind for sure. Uh, John, would you, would you like to add something too? No. Um, no, I, I have always been amused. This is just uh, sort of adding to it, I guess. Um, now that we have more statutes, uh, my favorite part of the Investigatory Powers Act is how you can apply for review of whether you are being under surveillance or being wiretapped, whatever. And if I remember correctly, because I taught this a few years ago and haven't looked at it in the last couple of years, you can make a request to the agency 
who then responds with either, yes, you are, there is a warrant, which, you know, or my favorite response is, you are not being illegally, you are not illegally under surveillance. That's the answer. That you, you're not, we don't know if you're under surveillance, <laughs> and if so, they have a warrant. Um, so, you know, yeah, it's, um, we seem, we think we have better protection now, I think, because we are, we have statutes. Uh, the answer is, I don't think so. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think we, you know, uh, uh, same book in 20 years, I'm, I'm, I'm for it. more sophisticated techniques uh, than planting microphones, but. Um, well, I'm just closing a curtain because it's very sunny, so. Yes, I know. I, mine is, my son has moved. It was in my eye. Um, I have one story about wiretapping, just a very brief one because it's funny. Um, when I was at university, um, I was there during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and one of my my boyfriend's roommate uh, was the son of a lawyer in a very well-known left-wing American law firm that had done some work for the Cuban government. So we knew that his telephone was being wiretapped. And then in those days, actually, you could tell anyway, because if you picked up the phone, you heard some clicks uh, that was a dead giveaway. Uh, and so what is <laughs> roommates would do before they left the house for the day, they would dial the phone number for time and temperature, which you can do in the States. And then the voice on the other end, they would leave the phone off the hook and they would record eight hours or the FBI was recording eight hours of the time is now so-and-so and the temperature is, and this would go on all day till they came home and hung up the phone. So I always thought about those poor FBI agents who had to go through hours and hours and hours of time and temp um, because we knew, we knew that, you know. Uh, so yeah, it wasn't really all that, at least in the US. It wasn't that 